Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of the ICE podcast with me, your host, Austin Haney. And I am so excited because, guys, we have a very special guest to me uh, joining us today, and her name is Patty Stallings. And for those of you that don't know her, um, she was one of the leaders in the organization that I used to work with in China. And she just represents so many things to me. She is a friend. Uh, she is someone that's full of wisdom and discernment. Um, she's someone that, like, you're, you feel frenzied about everything that's going on in life, and you go and talk to Patty, and all of a sudden you feel calm, and you feel secure, and you feel cared for. And uh, she's just made such a big impact in my life. And so, Patty, I want to say thank you for being on the podcast today, and we're excited to have you. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Austin. I um, just adore you for so many reasons and am excited about this venture that you've started. Yeah, absolutely. So, Patty, um, you know, I've heard a little bit of your story um, with going to China and things like that, but I know that you served in China a long time, and I want to hear, like, I almost want you to take us back to the beginning for that initial call of what, like, led you to go to China and um, what that journey looked like. Yeah, well, that's a long time ago, about 25 years ago from when we first went to China. And honestly, our plan was to go for one year, teach in a university and experience the culture. We had two children when we decided we were going and three when we actually went. And um, that in itself, we could spend, you know, an hour talking about that, but we won't. Um, But it... Uh, yeah, there was just a nudge towards uh, the people of China and what the Lord was doing there. And yeah, we were, uh, yeah, we just fell in love with China once we were there and in particular with the people that we were working with. So it's hard for me to totally dissect the big long story of how we were drawn into that work, but um, I will say this, it was very different for me and for my husband, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, for my own life, and I think so many people that have been to China or done overseas work, it starts out as just like a faraway place, and you might hear about needs, um, you might hear about like cool things that are happening there or whatever, read a book or something like that, but then you go there and you start to meet the people and you fall in love with the people, and you get to know them, and I think the Father just really works in your heart so in getting to know the people, and so I'm curious, like, what did China kind of look like in those early days, and were there some of those stories or some of those people that really just, like, you, you started to realize, like, this is, I think, where the Father's calling us. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you about our first day in China. We were um, taken to the Friendship Hotel, which was one of the very few places that foreigners could go and and stay. And that first morning, I walked out, and I grew up in North Dakota, so very rural. And But I walked out to the street, and bicycles were going by both ways, and occasionally a car. And I just felt such a sense of home. It was unexplainable because it was entirely different from anything that I had ever experienced, but it was just that settledness that, yeah, I'm I'm supposed to be here. I'm at home. I belong here. And then as I began to meet people, and in particular students, um, just had a sense that I was made for this. Like I, the way that Chinese relate to one another and a lot of values that they have fit who I am. And so it just felt right. Yeah. So you said that you like initially you were going for one year and then you wound up saying, was it like 25 years you said? Yeah, 24. 24. Okay. So was there like, was that one year at a time, like you kept making that decision year after year after year? Or was there a point where you're like, we are, uh, we're going to be here until it becomes really clear that we're not supposed to be here? Yeah, both. In the beginning, it was kind of a year by year. Um, actually, the first year we did some real seeking and like, why are we here? What's our purpose? And felt the, that the answer to that was to serve the servants. And so that then became our filter in what we'd do next. And so our first few years 
you know, there was a time when we had to decide if we were going to stay or not stay. And the, um, yeah, would just agonize over that decision then we're like, yeah, we're staying. And at some point we're going, like, why are we putting ourselves through this? Mm-hmm. Why don't we just plan on being here until we either aren't allowed to be here or we have a very clear indication that mm-hmm. our time there is finished? And that once we mm-hmm. decided that, it, yeah, it settled us quite a bit. Yeah. Honestly, I, I understand that that process because I've also been the one that has agonized <laughs> over decisions and wanting to do like the exact right thing. And I remember actually someone shared um, with me one time at an ATC conference that we were at uh, together. Someone told me that sometimes like old orders are still good orders. And mm-hmm. it really was like helpful for me because it was like, this seems so clear, but now I'm like trying to get new wisdom, new perspective, new understanding. And then it's like, what if the old orders were still good orders? And that really, um, that was really encouraging to me at the time. That is and, good. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, it's just, you just keep showing up, right? You keep mm-hmm. showing up for what God has for you. And w- w- the one time that when we did kind of take everything off the table was when we'd go on a home assignment and for a visual, it was like we had a piece of paper that was blank and we'd sign the bottom of the piece of paper and then say, here you go. Hmm. Whatever you feel in the top, we're in. Whatever Hmm. pleases you will please us. And um, often that was the answer, not those exact same words, but the old orders were the good orders. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. I love that though. You're putting your, your yes on the table, right? And so, you know, Patty, I kind of caught you near the end, end-ish time in, your, in China, and I think even that came, you, you didn't realize maybe that it was the very end, you realized you were kind of getting close, but um, mm-hmm. didn't know exactly when that date was come. No, none of us knew how COVID would change things and everything right. like that. Um, but what, what I admired so much, what, even just from when I first met you, is I knew that you had like been overseas for a while and you had a lot of experience, but you weren't the person that was teaching us um, all the tech tips or all the teaching strategies or like, I don't know, the specifics of things like that. Um, and every time we interacted with you, you were the person that was trying to get through to us the importance of having a relationship with the Father. Or, and you talked to us about abiding, um, being like a tree that's planted, um, just so many different um, illustrations and stuff that were helpful in that process. Um, but I want to know, like, why was that so important? And how did, how do you feel like that abiding? Why was that like the message that you wanted to get across to us? Yeah, I would say that John fifteen five is probably the crux of the answer to that, where um, Jesus is talking about, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And actually, you know, if you're in me, like, the possibilities are endless, but without me, you can do nothing. And over the years, I saw others and myself just kind of living on fumes at times and um, yeah, just be, being really busy doing nothing hmm. because he was not the center of those activities. And um, so I'm so convinced that whatever he's asked us to do, yeah, if he's not, if he's not the center of that, if he's not the one guiding, directing, um, energizing us in that, we're just spinning our wheels. And I really, really want to see every person living an eternally significant life. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't see it happening without abiding. Yeah. That's, that's so true. And I know for me, it feels like my personality is wired to be wanting to go and do things. Like I want to share, I want to teach, I want to like go and help others serve. Like I'm wired to like feel significance and stuff from the external things that I do. But it's, it was really interesting, like in that whole process that I, I, I think knowing you and then also just my first few months in China helped me understand that the most important thing maybe that's going to happen in the season isn't going to be something I share or do or teach someone else. It's going to be 
if God actually, if I actually have a relationship with God and if I actually know him like personally. And, um, I remember at our training, you share with us like a passage that now every time I read the passage, I think about you, Patty. And so I just wanted to, I wanted to read it real quick because maybe it'll be encouraging to someone, but it's Jeremiah 17, seven and eight. And I know you know these verses, but it says the man, or we could say the woman, but the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed in the, is in the Lord is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought and it will not cease producing fruit. And I just read that and I'm like, man, I want to have a life like that, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so what, what would you say is like, I almost want to say the secret sauce, <laughs> like, but how, how do we <laughs> like, how do we go from just hearing that and say, I want to have a life like that to how do we, how do we cultivate that and have a life like that? Yeah. Well, I think different season of, seasons in my life, I might've answered that differently, but there are some elements that remain true. Uh, one is the consistency of establishing rhythms that promote that kind of life. Um, whether you call them spiritual disciplines, or I prefer the term like soul strengthening habits or soul shaping habits, that you have things in place that you're doing consistently that support a life of devotion. And it's a little different, you know, we've, most of us were taught to have devotions, but I really want to live a devoted life. Mm. And so I need to center my life around those things that, that enhance that, support it, promote that in my own life. Mm. And I, I believe with all my heart, those things are really, really important. But I would say over time, um, I've shifted a little bit in this idea that this life is all about our pursuit of God and to rest a little bit more in the fact that, and he pursues us. Hmm. And that's the faithfulness that really counts is his faithfulness to pursue us. He's so committed to abide in us. You know, we talk a lot about abiding in him, but Equally or more important is his commitment to abide in us. And so even in those dry periods, even though in those wilderness times, he's still pursuing us. He's still committed to dwell in us. And we can just take a deep breath and rest in that. Um, yeah. So, yes, there is a part of the equation that we can... Um, we can make sure we're positioned and postured in a way that we're growing in our awareness and our responsiveness to who he is and to his presence. But there's also that piece of his faithfulness. It never changes. It's, yeah, we are just loved so deeply. Yeah, that's so good. And I think like understanding that we are being pursued really and, and that like he cares about us and is pursuing us more even than we're pursuing him yes. it it that that really is like so important because it's it's not like I, I don't know when it when faith can become so complex and so challenging and things like that then i feel like in dry seasons we have a tendency to put it off you know but whenever it's like this relationship that honestly he's the he is cultivating and he's pursuing um even when I'm not as active, that's, that's just like so encouraging. And, um, you posted a picture of like quite a while ago now, but it was on your Instagram and it was a picture of a sunflower and it just was like, I forget your exact caption, but essentially it was like, I want to be like this, like turning my face towards the sun, mm -hmm. you know, and how flowers like face towards the sun. And I feel like, um, you know, one of the ways that I've seen you like live that devoted life has been, you know, I'm sure you have things like a devotional time or a quiet time or something like that, but it's more like the lifestyle. So whether it's getting out in nature or just going on walks and learning to like see God's hand in like daily life. So talk to me a little bit about, yeah, just how you see him and how you like build a friendship and a relationship with him in like daily life more than just in a quiet time or something. Mm, like yeah. Well, some of it is that spiritual practices, like the practice of examine, where at the end of the day, you just look back on the day and 
look at where where did I recognize your presence and where did I miss it? There's some of that. Um, I think that to um, being mindful and aware of what stirs up your affections for Jesus, um, knowing what those things are, for me it certainly is nature, like getting out in nature, just the glory of God. I like the way one guy said um, when you're in nature, it turns up the glory of God, turns up the volume on his glory. And for me, that's so true. Um, so that really just my soul can rest in nature. And I'm in awe and I am feel joy just kind of bubble up in me when I'm seeing something new in nature. So... That just, it stirs up my affections for him, right? And mm -hmm. for me, journaling is a way that um, also I can process, especially process scripture through um, journaling. Um, yeah, community is huge for that. I like learning to be interdependent and vulnerable and available in community. Um yeah, there's nothing quite like that to stir up our affection for him and our also recognize our need for him. Yeah, for sure. So I want to talk to you some about um, me and you have been through a few, uh, I guess, trial or unexpected experiences. Um, I think COVID is like the most big and obvious one that, you know, I guess the whole world went through, not just us. Um, <laughs> But I remember when I first met you, there was also the experience of we were planning to go to China and then we had a bunch of visa issues and I was freaking out. Everyone I knew was like kind of freaking out. <laughs> and um, I remember in both of those experiences, you became like really a person that I could look up to because while I was frenzied, didn't know what to do, like had so much unsettledness and uncertainty, um, you helped just speak in encouragement and peace and trust and faith and all, all this kind of stuff during those times that was really like calming and reassuring. Mm -hmm. And so I want to, I want to know, like, as someone that is leading and shepherding people and stuff, um, how have you learned just to be that voice of, I guess, assuredness and comfort in seasons mm -hmm. of un uncertainty? I think what comes to my mind first is, um, I have such a deep, deep trust in the Lord. And I'm not saying that as, oh, look at me, I've cultivated this. I, I'm wired that way. And I think my experiences in childhood and just developed in me like, yeah, I can trust him. Hmm. And so I'm convinced he's actively always at work, whether we recognize it or not. I mean, I think a big part of heaven is going to be, we're telling our story and Jesus is saying, yeah, but let me tell you the rest of the story, what I was doing in that situation or um, just kind of revealing to us how actively he's been involved in our lives. And um, knowing that, like he's, he's got us. He, he loves us so fully, deeply, completely, and he's got us. And he often uses difficult things to um, kind of reveal, open more of our, our eyes to who he is and different aspects of who he is. And so I actually kind of like stepping into the messy with people because um, I just have so much confidence that he... He will bring good out of it. And usually that good is our character development. Like there's something he's building in us that's really, um, yeah, we, we get to look more like him through those experiences. We talked a little bit about abiding and just like, I guess, building that relationship or that friendship and connection with God. But I think part of abiding is also like remaining and what, one of the things that I really look up to you about is that, I mean, honestly, you've been, or you were in China for 24 years, you know, or you've been married to Sam for, I think it's like 40, 40, yeah. 40 years now, yeah. which is crazy. That's so, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. I was uh, two when I got married, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about 
like not just, uh, I want to talk about long obedience, you know, in the same direction and perseverance and what it means to remain. Cause you know, we live in a world where like no one does anything for 20 years or, or 40 years. And so how, um, how have you continued to show up and, um, you know, I know to do something for 20 years, you don't just like make one commitment and then take a big step and you're 20 years down the road. Like it's a ton of little mm-hmm. steps throughout the way. And so just talk to us a little bit about, I guess, the root of perseverance. Yeah, I think perseverance is such a valuable, uh, a valuable character trait, right? It's, it's, and you're right, it's hard to find in this world. Mm-hmm. And I think what enhanced our ability to stay is that there was a great values match. What we valued, our organization valued. Mm-hmm. And um, what we saw as important, um, like care of people, the organization also put their money where their mouth was in terms of care of people. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think that's that's a key, like there's a values alignment in what you're doing and who you're doing it with. And when that happens, it's easier to persevere because you have a sense of purpose that matches the purpose of the others that you're working alongside. Um, I also think community is a big part of that. Um, having others that you're co-laboring with that are like-minded, like-hearted. You develop friendships that become really deep, meaningful parts of who you are that just increases the staying power. And then I would say, um, yeah, and sometimes the things you get to do in life, it's such a privilege, right? Mm -hmm. It's such a privilege to be in a front row seat watching what God is doing in a person or an area or a location. And I think if you have that mindset, like it is a privilege to serve him. Yeah. There's a lot of joy in that. So, and I feel like that's a choice, right? We can choose to be grateful. We can choose to look for, um, the good in people and organizations and situations, or we can complain. And I would say one thing that really shaped my thinking in that is the story of Joseph in Genesis. There's a verse that says, when he was in prison, he experienced the favor and kindness of God. I thought, man, if you're, if you're in a prison in a foreign land for something you didn't do, and hmm. And you can recognize that the favor and kindness of God is there. I ought to be able to see the favor and kindness of God in my life on a daily basis. And if I just look for it. So I think that mindset has helped us kind of weather some of the bumps in the road. I remember at an ATC conference also, I was kind of wrestling, you know, where is, where is kind of like God, God leading me and stuff. And someone shared with me that, um, you know, it's like the, the, picture of the two roads diverging in the woods and we want to take both can't take both kind of thing and um a person was telling me that you know we tend to emphasize the good and the road that we're not on and minimize Mm -hmm. its like difficulty and we tend to you know emphasize the hard and the road that we're on and minimize its good sometimes and and this um this lady was saying that she had kind of taken both roads like she had a business and a life in america and and, like kind of lived that life and then also like lived a, a life in china and what she was saying was both roads are hard (laughs) and like both roads are filled with (laughs) filled with good and beauty. And then both roads are filled with like difficulty and to try to not like idolize one over the other or compare them. Um, but I like what you said of just like, um, learning to see the good and the joy of where you're at. And I think that's when, when I think back to my like time in China, the number one like word that I feel like resonates with me is just the word joy. Um, Mm. because there was certainly difficulty, there was hardship, there was uncertainty and doubt and learning and all, all of these kinds. But, but the number one, like overall feeling was just, that was the most joyful experience that like I've ever been a part of. And I think I, I remember um, even reading a book about a guy that had gone overseas and done a, a lot of different work. And uh, during his life, he had like lost a lot. And I think he had like his wife had died and like just some other things that happened and uh, had really like, 
I guess could say sacrificed a lot, but then he like gave a speech at the, near the end of his life. And at the end of his speech, he's like, I never made a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And I think that that really resonated with me is because like, obviously in a human way, he made a lot of sacrifices. Um, but the overwhelming joy of like knowing that you're doing what you were made to do, I feel just like it just covers up like so, so many of them. Yeah. Yeah. So. I really believe that living our life for the purposes of the kingdom. I mean, that that's how, that's how God designed it. Like we would co-labor with him, co-create with him and his purposes are fulfilled and our joy is made complete. Hmm. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'm curious. Um, I want to know a little bit about just, I think this, I think something I've wrestled with is kind of knowing the season of life that you're in and especially whenever you feel like your heart is kind of being pulled in multiple directions. And I know you experienced this a little bit with having a real heart for China and like a longing to be there while also like having some things that keep you not or don't allow you to be there. And and even like the things you love here, like getting to spend time with your grandkids and things like that. Um, And I know I've, I've felt tension in my own life in multiple ways of having a heart for this, but a skill set in this and, and different things. And so, um, I remember one of the most liberating things that you ever said to me was um, when I was really wrestling with that personally for, do I go back to China, continue trying to teach online or like I've got some interest in photography and video and stuff like this. And I was really struggling with that. Um, You asked me like, Austin, what do you think your twenties are for? And I remember giving you some long answer about undistracted devotion and like this big spiritual answer and stuff. And you're like, that's, that's good. And and then you're like, (laughs) do you want to know what I think your twenties are for? And I was like, yes, please, please, Patty, please tell me. And you're like, I think your twenties are for trying things and they're a good time to like try things. And I remember, um, I had so much invested in, I want to make the right decision. And then hearing you say that helped liberate me, um, in a lot of ways and allowed me to kind of like step out and see like, well, what, what do I really want, um, during the season? And so, I'm curious, just like as you're, as you continue to evaluate your own life direction and decision and you, and you help others do the same, like how, how have you learned to help people understand the season of life they're in? Well, yes, I agree with my advice to you. Try things in your twenties, first of (laughs) all, but don't stop. Like I, Mm. I think we can get stuck in ruts. And um, hmm. I feel like life it has these different seasons where we ought to pause and reflect and sometimes renegotiate what life is about and hmm. um, sometimes turn our attention elsewhere. Um, and I, I think you can do that and still that long obedience in the same direction can be true. So I just think of different things that I was involved in within the those 24 years in China, there's quite a variety of things. And some things were better fit than others. And um, I think the key to that is to not just say, that's not for me, or that's not a good fit. I think the key is to say, you know, that this, it's not the best fit for me, but I've got to figure out why and um, learn from that. Right. So yeah. I, I think that especially in your younger years, that's really fruitful reflection. Mm-hmm. Like so maybe someone says, you know, I hate lesson planning. Why do you hate it? What is it about it? Is it the yeah. um, sitting in a room by yourself doing it? Is it um, having to structure something? Is it that um, what you really prefer is being in front of the students? I mean, yeah. there's, it's not just one thing, right? It's every, those things are made of multiple things. So dissecting that really can help you refine your purpose and refine what your strengths really are. For me, that resonates with, well, that makes, means that nothing is wasted is even if mm. I like do something that this isn't exactly what I wanted to do long term. Well, it taught me things about myself. Maybe it helped me build some new skills or, or even connected me to some people. And, um, I think uh, 
you know, we talk about that as far as like skill sets and learning about ourselves. But I think um, when COVID first started and um, our organization kind of had to pivot and we went into this season of like waiting with purpose, I remember um, one of the things that really like resonated with me and a few of our friends were talking about was like when Paul and stuff was on his journeys that he, he tended to have a direction that he was headed or a place that he would like to go, but he always made sure to like not to miss the person or, or the opportunity right in front of him. And mm-hmm. um, I, the way I like shorthand say that is like, um, you know, like when he was on the way to Rome, he didn't miss Malta, you know, like that was the yeah. island he got shipwrecked on. And, um, and there was things for him to do there. And it's, it's neat because I think even when we think we know where we're headed, a lot of times we don't really know where we're headed and <laughs> we don't have a full vision of that picture. But um, yeah, just being present and like getting the most, I guess, out of the opportunities right in front of you. Yeah. And pay attention, right? Pay attention. Mm-hmm. Don't just scoot through life, but really, yeah, think about what you're doing and how it's impacting you and notice how that impacts others. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's, can reveal a lot about your purpose. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, another thing I want to ask you about is like, um, so you're, I guess, a little bit older. I don't want to say old, but you're <laughs> older. And I think that, I don't know if you feel this way, but it seems like there could be a sense of, well, I've already served. I've already invested so much. I've like been faithful. You know, I've, I've served 24 years in China, you know, all, like all these things like Faithfulness is something I've done, so to speak. And now I'm just going to kind of coast on out and, uh, and almost like you can go through the motions or whatever, but, um, how, how, I just don't believe that that is like who you are. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, even after having done so much, how are you continuing to like press into what it's got to have for me now? Or what, how can I be useful? How can I serve? How can I invest in other people now? Yeah. That's, that's a really great question. I recently heard someone say this, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm hanging on to it. Um, she said, you know, you can either keep updating the 25-year-old version of yourself, or you can mature into a wise elder. Mm-hmm. And then she said, choose wisely. <laughs> I thought that was such good advice. And um, yeah, this is a different season. It's a, it's um, my hope is to become a wide, wise elder um, that is constantly building into other people. I think something happens around your 50s where you start, well, I'm going to say if you're wise, you start to shift your focus from what can I do to how can I help other people do what they were called to do? How can I support them? How can I encourage? How can I equip? And um, how can I uh, influence them towards an eternally significant life and living that way? So that's certainly some of the shift that I'm thinking through, like in these, um, this last how much ever time I have. Um, what do I want to be true about me? Hmm. Like, you know, my my next big birthday will be 65. So, you know, and I have four years to get to that point. What do I want to be true about me at age 65? All right. If that's true, then what do I need to do now to move towards that? What adjustments do I need to make? What do I need to renegotiate about how I'm living now to make sure that that's true when I reach that point? And I, we can do that at any age, right? We just think about what do I want to be true about me? And we set a direction for our life. We decide what we're going to invest in. We decide um, what we're going to give ourselves to. And um, yeah, we might not make it. I'm Like I might not be entirely all I want to be at age 65, mm-hmm. but I'll be a lot closer than if yeah. I don't make some intentional decisions towards that. So have you thought about any, like, you know, what some of that looks like practically for you? What is that? What would Patty like to be like at 65? 
Yes. I want to be more Christ-centered in all my thoughts, actions, attitudes, behaviors. Um, definitely, I want that to be more true of me. Um, I want to be wholehearted in what he's given me to do that's right in front of me now. Um, I want to be the best Nana that's ever lived on this planet, <laughs> <laughs> which I know that's that's a pretty stiff. Uh, Got some competition. Yeah, I do. I have some real competition there. Um, but also there's some things I want to do. Um, oh, let me say first, there's some things I've thought about recently, like do I don't honestly I don't feel like 61. That's where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. I don't feel 61. I feel like 41. So I was thinking, all right, what would my 61 year old self wish that my 41 year old self mm-hmm. had done differently? Mm-hmm. And so I just thought of a few things. Well, I'd, and I wish I would memorize had memorized more because now that's a lot more difficult. So you really ought to be doing that in your 20s because that's the prime time. Um, But I wish that I had um, started like physically building more towards stamina and strength because that's harder to do now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, okay, if I'm telling my 41-year-old self, I wish you had done those things, well, then start doing those things now because at 81, I don't want 81-year-old Patty to look back at 61-year-old Patty and like, why? You knew you should be doing those things. Why didn't you do them? Um, So a few things like that. Um, Yeah. I I long to be a person that um, is building into others, like that every person I meet feels um, like they've been invested in, even in short conversations. So I know I fail a lot in that, but I I know that intentionality does highlight to me opportunities to do that that I might miss if I hadn't made some decisions along those lines. Well, I I love that that perspective. And Patty, I just want to honestly honor you because I know you said that you like fail a lot and I'm sure... We all feel like that, but it's funny, total, you know, I might've only had less than 10 conversations like in person with you, but I feel like I can remember every single conversation and the investment you made in me, the way you just made me feel known and cared for and Mm -hmm. where we could laugh and go from laughing to talking about like deep things and and stuff has been so good. And um, I'm curious, just kind of like closing up, um, you know, you said you wanted to like really pour back and invest in this next generation and things and, and things. Um, so if you were to kind of like be handed the microphone right now and you just had something that you wanted to encourage people with, um, what do you feel like that would be? Oh, that's a big question too. Um, yeah, I would say stay in love with Jesus. There's, um, there's a lot of distractions in this world. There's a lot of bumps in the road. But just stay in love with him and you'll be okay. Um, You know, expect that there will be wilderness times, but also expect that he'll meet you in those wilderness times and he will shepherd you through them. Um, Expect that there's going to be some heartache and some suffering. But like we talked about, those are really unique times to let Jesus minister to you in ways that you can't when everything's going perfectly and so um yeah do do not give up on him he's not going to give up on you that's a good word well patty thank you again just for being on the podcast today and like i said you have really been an awesome example for me of someone that has done just that and has cultivated a lifestyle of long obedience in the same direction and really just knowing God. And, um, I think like what better legacy that you could leave than that. And so thank you again. It really was a pleasure Uh, to have you today. Thank you, Austin. You are really kind and encouraging and I appreciate your words of affirmation and, um, I'm going to try to live up to them. (laughs) All right. Right on. Bye.